going to continue our lessons in the Gospel of Mark, uh, continuing with the rest of chapter 3, and then we have a reading from the prophet Isaiah and one from the Heavenly Doctrine for the New Church. Beginning at verse 8 of chapter 3, where we left off, it says, And Jerusalem and Idumea and beyond the Jordan and those from Tyre and Sidon, a great multitude, when they heard how many things Jesus was doing, came to him. So he told his disciples that a small boat should be kept ready for him because of the multitude, lest they should crush him. For he healed many, so that as many as had afflictions pressed about him to touch him. And the unclean spirits, whenever they saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, saying, You are the Son of God. But he sternly warned them that they should not make him known. And he went up on the mountain and called, him, called to him those who himself wanted, and they came to him. Then he appointed twelve, that they might be with him, and that, they, that he might send them out to preach, and to have power to heal sicknesses, and to cast out demons. Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, to whom he gave the name Bonaragas, the sons of thunder, that is, Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, the son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon, the Canaanite, or the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him, and they went into a house. Then the multitude came together again, so they could not so much as eat bread. But when his own people heard about this, they went out to lay hold of him, for they said, He is out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, He has Beelzebub, and by the ruler of demons he casts out demons. So he called them to himself. And said to them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, the kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand but has an end. No one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man, and then he will plunder his house. Assuredly, I say to you, all sins will be forgiven, the sons of men, and whatever blasphemies they utter. But he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is subject to eternal condemnation. Because they said he has an unclean spirit. Then his brothers and his mother came, and standing outside, they sent to him, calling him. And a multitude was sitting around him, and they said to him, Look, your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. But he answered them, saying, Who is my mother or my brothers? And he looked around in a circle at those who sat about him and said, here are my mother and my brothers, for whoever does the will of God is my brother and my sister and my mother. You also read a few verses from Isaiah chapter 59, verses 1 through 3 and 20 and 21. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor his ear heavy, that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he will not hear. For your hands are defiled with blood, and your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken lies, your tongue has murmured perversity. The Redeemer will come to Zion, though. And to those who turn from transgression in Jacob, says the Lord. As for me, says the Lord, this is my covenant with them. 
my spirit who is upon you, and my words which I have put in your mouth shall not depart from your mouth, nor from the mouth of your descendants, nor from the mouth of uh, sorry, nor from the mouth of your descendants' descendants, says the Lord, from this time forth and even forevermore. Our final lesson is from the work Arcana Celestia, number 10,057. It says that it is known that what is seen with the eyes and heard with our ears is perceived inwardly with a person. And as it were, passes out of the world through the eyes and the ears into our thought and thus into our understanding. For the thought is of our understanding. And if they are such things as are loved, those things from the world, through our eyes and ears into our understanding, if they are loved, they pass from this into their will and from the will by way of the understanding, then back into our speech in our mouth and also into the actions of our body. Such is the circle of things out in the world, through the natural person into his spiritual, and this from this again into the world. Be it known that this circle is instituted, though, from our will, which is the inmost of our lives, and that it begins there, and that it is from this accomplished. And the will of a person who is in good is directed from heaven by the Lord, though it appears otherwise. For there is an influx from the spiritual world into the natural, thus through the internal person into his natural, into his external, but not the reverse. For the internal person is in heaven, but the external is in the world." As this circle is the circle of a person's life, therefore during a person's rebirth or spiritual regeneration, he is regenerated according to the same. And when he has been regenerated, he lives and acts in accordance with it. Therefore, during a person's regeneration, the truths which are to be of faith are insinuated through the hearing and through our sight. And then these truths are implanted in our memory. From this memory, they are withdrawn into the thought that belongs to the understanding. And those which are loved become a part of our will. And insofar as they become a part of our will, they become our life. For the will of a person is his very life. And insofar as they become the life, they become of his affection and so the charity of his will and the faith in their understanding. Afterwards, the person speaks and acts from his own life, which is the life of charity and of faith. From charity, which is of the will, goes forth the speech out of the mouth and also the act of the body, both by way of the understanding, thus by the way of faith. From all this, it is evident that the circle of rebirth or regeneration of a person is like the circle of his life in general, and that it is in like manner instituted by the will by means of an influx out of heaven from the Lord. Here end our lessons. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. So in our series on Mark, one of the things that I'm hoping to uh, kind of drive across is that our biblical stories aren't just little pieces that are here and there, but it's actually a continuous story in the way that the Lord interacts with us in our own process of rebirth. That as we pass even from chapter to chapter, it's not like, well, we're just telling a different part of the story. It actually comes through the whole story is actually a continuous series about the processes we go through in our own lives. And in Mark, what we're focusing on 
is the development of our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why we're calling this series Getting to Know Jesus Through Mark. And what we've come to know about Jesus in Mark so far is he has a lot of power to do a lot of things. Remember, Mark is this urgent, fast gospel, and it, there's no Christmas. It's just jump right in, baptism, and then he's working. He's casting out demons, and he is healing the sick. He heals the guy with leprosy. He heals Simon's mother-in-law. He's just going left and right and healing and casting out demons. Lots of power. And that power is being challenged over and over in different ways in these first few chapters. Now, one of the ways we can see how from chapter to chapter we need to go back and see what happened at the end of chapter 2 to see how it relates to chapter 3 here. So the end of chapter 2 talks about, the Lord says, that the Sabbath was made for people and not people for the Sabbath. It's a very simple statement, but he's saying something very profound and important about the reason why people are conjoined with the Lord, why we should even be in this relationship where we come to church, where we try to learn from his word, where we pray, where we try to have this relationship, that it's, it's not a transactional relationship where if I make sure I go to church every Sunday and I read my word every month morning and I say my prayers exactly right, and I pay enough tithes to the church, and I do these things, in some ways that feels like we're doing the right thing. And the people who are doing the right thing would be doing those same things. So it is correct, it's good, that relationship of us doing it kind of transactionally is a start. But it's not that we do this so that the Lord does that. That's not exactly how it works. It's more of a transformational relationship that we have with the Lord, where as we come to know him better, as the truths start to descend into our understanding, just like we, the, the passage was saying that from our sight and our hearing, we receive things into our mind, and it goes from there into our hearts, and if we love it, then we'll go back out, it'll come back out of our mouths and in our actions. That seems like a pretty normal cycle. Now, in our relationship with the Lord, if we think about it as transformational as opposed to transactional, it doesn't work the same. It doesn't look the same as that. If it's just transactional, then you just have to do the actions. So you can see things and hear things and do things, but the will never becomes involved. You're just doing it. Well, the will is involved. It's just selfish. It's like, well, I'm doing this so that I get my happiness. I'm get, doing this so that I can go to heaven. I'm doing this for me. And that's not what salvation's about. You know, the word salvation actually has the same root as the word healing. And this is what the Lord came to do, to heal. And this is what we hear over and over in the Gospel of Mark, to heal and to cast out demons. That's the power he gave to his disciples in this chapter. He calls them and he sends them out, giving them the power to heal and to cast out demons. Our will isn't involved if it's just about me. Our will isn't conjoined to the Lord. And that's what heaven is, is when our will and the Lord's will are the same, when they are one. That's what atonement really is, is to be one with our, with our Lord in our will. Now, where we're getting at in our story today, there's two main things I really want to look at. One of them is what our title for the sermon is today, which is the unforgivable sin. So we read through that. How can there be an unforgivable sin? One that the Lord looks at, like this is what it seems. Well, all the other sins, all the other blasphemies, he says, that the sons of men will commit, those will be forgiven. But not blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. What is... What is that? And then why is it so terrible that the Lord can't forgive it? Or do we need to read this differently? And it's that latter one we're going to get to. The second thing about this story that I really want to look at, and it's related, is where does power come from? And this is the constant struggle that shows up in this story, but also in our lives. Does our power to do good come from the Lord? Or does it come from ourselves? 
Does our power to act in any way come from ourselves or does it come from the Lord? Does the power to change our lives come from ourselves or does it come from the Lord? And the hard part is, like, even if we intellectually say, yes, it is the Lord, there's still this feeling that I'm the one doing the action. So this is where we're going to start this conversation, is let's pretend that this is representative of our lives. We have, what is this here? A screw and a piece of wood. So the object of our lives is all being wrapped up into this one little uh, thing here, which is I need to screw this into the piece of wood. That's the work of our regenerator. The, the cycle or circle of life is being represented all in this. Now, if we're looking at this as our job, most of the time we'd probably try to turn, and this would take a lot of work to use our hand to screw this screw into the two by four, right? In fact, you probably will almost never, like it, maybe you'll sit there for thousands of years just turning this to get it to go in once. And so we, we realize that we don't really have the power to do this on our own. We don't have the power to live life, to be changed, to actually live into the life of heaven on our own. So we might toil away for days and years and years and, and accomplish next to nothing. And the Lord tells us, no, there's this tool. Remember, Mark is about displaying the power of the Lord and accepting the power of the Lord. So the Lord's saying, there is power. There's my power, and, and there's a tool that you can use to make life easier, to be able to do that. And so it's, it's my word. The Lord tells us it's his word. It's the Holy Spirit that gives people power. It's another sermon, but I do want to touch on this. The Holy Spirit is a huge topic uh, that, that needs to be defined. The, the, the Holy Spirit, simply defined, is the proceeding of the Lord's divine truth. It is the proceeding of the Lord in what it is received. So whether that is the Lord's word, that's why the Lord's word is the Holy Spirit speaking to us, because it's the Lord speaking through the Lord's word. If it's in a person, if a person is received the Holy Spirit, it's the Lord acting through them. It's the action of the Holy Spirit. So the Lord says there is power. There, there's a tool, his word. And so we might go in there and start reading. With, Man, there's, that's a that looks like that fits right there. And, and the work starts to get possible. There's still, it's still kind of difficult, though. It's still toiling. It's still hard to do this. If this is my job in life and the screwdriver keeps slipping, you know how frustrating it is when you're working with the screw and it just strips out? Does ever feel like that in life? Like, man, it just doesn't work, and it's just messing up, and it's not working. This is us working with the Lord oftentimes with just giving him a little bit of power, giving him a little bit of credit, saying, yeah, but I still, I still have the power to do this in my life. It's still trying to hold on to I have ownership of my own life. I have power to do things of my own will. And so it's not utilizing the tools fully. It's still very manual in the way that we do our lives. So maybe we get frustrated with this and, and we go through some temptations and difficulties in life and we go back to the Word and we go, man, there's real power in there. And you notice that this is so much easier. Oop, I better not screw that into my hand. To just do because the power is actually in the tool itself. The power is in the Lord. It doesn't look, if, if you were a caveman and came upon this, you wouldn't know what it is. You didn't, wouldn't know the power that is contained within it. You wouldn't even necessarily know that a battery contains power. The Lord's word is full of power. The, the Holy Spirit proceeding from the Lord is full of power. That's where all of our power to live our, our lives comes from. And this is especially important because this isn't just how life is because often we think that that's what life is and then we open up the next door and we've got this here. And we open up the next door, we've probably got another board in there. So toiling away with that screwdriver is not going to do a whole lot for us. We've got, we've got a lot of work to do in life.
This is what this chapter is all about. How are, are we recognizing the power of the Lord? The man in this uh, story in the synagogue with his withered hand, the hand in the Lord's word represents power. And we should want to be this person with the withered hand. He is representing a very good state in us. It's when we recognize our own powerlessness. It's when we recognize that we don't have the power of ourselves that we're said to have that withered hand. If our hand is withered, that's because of our own selfishness. That's a different thing. But this man just being there in the synagogue and being willing to follow the Lord's command is recognizing I don't have the power of myself. The Lord tells him, stand forward. But what principles do you already have in your life? that you can live on, that you can live according to, that I've given you, that this is what the Lord's asking. Stand forward. Live into that. Stretch out your hand. You have that power from the Lord. And yeah, we're going to make mistakes. We're going to get things wrong. And this is addressed in, in the story. Well, all of these sins by the sons of men, the blasphemies of the sons of men that will be forgiven, well, those are the mistakes we make. Those are when we misunderstand something in the Lord's Word, when we misconstrue a story. Yeah, all those things can be forgiven. So what could possibly be the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit? It, it does relate to power. But we do need to address just really briefly this whole thing about forgiveness. If the Lord is divine mercy, if He is divine love, if all he does is forgive because that's what mercy does is forgive, how can there be something so bad that the Lord would say, I can't forgive that? Because that's not the way it works. The Lord is constantly forgiving. If, if, if somebody were in, done, have done anything, anything evil, doesn't matter what it is, the Lord's forgiveness is there immediately. He tells us to forgive seven times, 70 times, which means every time, all the time. So does the Lord just get that one exception? Yeah, but I get to not forgive here. No, he doesn't give himself an exception. The problem is, is that when we give no power to the Lord, when we say all power must come from me, and that's like looking at these screwdrivers and this drill and saying they have no power at all. I'm not even going to pick it up. I'm not even going to test it out because I know they won't work. I have to do this of my own power. When we get to a point where we decide that the power that the Lord has is nothing, so much to the point that we are not willing to even try his method. We aren't willing to read as we were. We aren't willing to pick up the tools he gives us. That is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Because there's no willingness to go to him. And if there's no willingness to use the tools, then there is no power from those tools. It's not unforgivable because the Lord won't forgive. It's because that we won't accept the means of forgiveness. Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is an often misunderstood concept. Uh, the simplest way to kind of get to this answer, though, is to look at the word blasphemy, which comes into our language directly from the Greek. To, to blaspheme something is to harm the name of it or harm its fame. Uh, blasphemy, we get that word fame from the fame part of that, and the blast means to hurt, to harm it. So it's harming the reputation of, or saying, the Holy Spirit has no power. And believing that in our hearts. That's what blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is. It's saying, I want no contact with the Lord. So let's back up and look at this story as a whole. This whole chapter, and I want you to go back and, and read it for yourself in terms of, what is this describing about the power dynamic between me and the Lord? Well, our first part of the, in the synagogue is that man with the hand. All power has to come through him, follow his instructions. This is really important and good. Uh, and it talks about how everybody's, you know, going to crush the Lord. I missed my little outline. 
um, says that everybody follow him, follows him, and, and we get to a point where Jesus says, make sure you have a small boat available for me. This is weird. It's a weird detail. Let's make sure they have a small boat so that I don't get crushed. You know, this is important little detail for when we're trying to live into the power that the Lord gives us. It doesn't mean that we're uh, going to just all of a sudden fix everything in life. We're going to come up against problems over and over. And when we come to those problems and, and try to go back to the Lord, think about our minds going, fix this now, and just yelling at the Lord, trying to get him to fix stuff. That's that crushing him, it's, but it's, it's searching for his power for the sake of our own self, not for the sake of what he wishes for us. That small boat is actually, where can, where can the Lord hide in us? Where we're not going to harm him while we're searching for the next step in our lives. So this is kind of an important little thing. It's just a detail I wanted to bring out because they all have meaning. This small boat is, where's a place where you're pretty certain about what you understand regarding the Lord, regarding his word, regarding religion and life? Is there something that you can hold on to and go, maybe I don't get this right now or how to act right now or how to acquire the Lord's power in this moment to change this in my life, but I know that the Lord has worked with this. I know that the Lord has all power. I know that the Lord is omniscient, that he is love. Like, what is that thing that we can, while we're confused over here, go, well, at least I know that about the Lord. And that maintains something really important while we struggle. I don't want to go through too many more details. Go back to, to read the story in terms of this thing about power and internal and external actions that we, we have. Um, at the end of this story, there's the weird part about the mother and brothers coming uh, to find Jesus, and they're calling out to him in the synagogue, and he goes, who, who are you talking about? My brothers and my mother, well, they're, they're in this circle here, sitting around me, it's because those who do the will of God are my brother, my sister's and my mother. And it's interesting, it does add sisters in that last one. Why? If you go back and read our uh, passage from Arcana Celestia, it's because it describes that circle of life that we were talking about. That it's not just the words on the page, this is the external, natural brothers and mother of Jesus. It's not just the words on the page that have power in our lives but it's what they do with our heart. Those who do the will of God are my brothers and my mother. That's when it's taken from just our understanding of, of what we've read, taken into our understanding and into our heart and acted on it. It's when we start to recognize that. And then you add the sister in, and you see there's an affection for that truth that grows. We take in what's true from the Lord's word, act upon it, and then we come to love what the Lord teaches us, and love doing what the Lord teaches us. And the more we, we do that, the more we're willing to hand power over to him. We're afraid of handing power over to the Lord because we're afraid of him taking away things that we want to keep. I want to remain grumpy. I don't want to stop gossiping. I want to feel you know, self-pity sometimes. Does it, you ever get stuck in like a pity party for yourself? We don't want the Lord to change. I don't want that power. The more we look at the Lord and go, oh, every time I take something into my life and apply it, I come to love his truth more and hand over the reins to him more and more because all true power comes from him. Nothing from ourselves. As of ourselves, we're like that withered hand but if we step forward into the truth he gives us, stretch out our hand and do the things he teaches us, we'll come to love it, and we will give him the power that is granted only to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And please rise. And now to the one only God, Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. 
The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.